First Kings 8. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, these are the heads of the people, and all the heads of the tribes, heads of the tribes, twelve tribes, the heads of the nation, and the heads of the twelve tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel. So there are leaders, there are rulers, there are people set up over the people. Unto King Solomon in Jerusalem. So everybody gathers in Jerusalem. That they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So Zion, when you read in your Bible, is the city of David. The Ark is not in Jerusalem yet. It's where David was. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon. At the feast in the set in the month Ethem, that's the only time that word shows up, which is the seventh month. And there's like three or four feasts in the seventh month. Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, I don't but you can Leviticus 23, 24, and 27. Leviticus 23, 24, and 27. In the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Well, at least Solomon learned something from David. You don't just throw it on the cart, and you just don't do what you want to do. I don't know if David told Solomon, but Solomon's right, I'm getting priests to do this job. And they brought up the ark of the Lord. They're carrying it on the stage. And the tabernacle of the congregation, they bring, the, they bring it off. And all the holy vessels... That were in the tabernacle. The snuffers, the dishes, the tables. Even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And that would be Kohath. They're the ones of Levi, of Aaron, that were to carry all the instruments. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, unity together, that were assembled on him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen. That could not be told nor numbered for a multitude. So they're just sacrificing animals to God. Pleasing God. Here comes the ark. The temple is built. And you couldn't even count them. Now animal activists. They would be upset. They'd be crying their britches off. Save the sheep. Save the oxen. No, they're for God. you got to save your own soul. I saw a guy today with a bumper sticker. I'm political for animals. Wow. You stand before God one day, where will your soul be? And the priest brought in the ark of the of the covenant of the Lord unto his place. Where? Unto the oracle of the house. So okay. The Kohites bring that ark into the courtyard, into the holy place, into the oracle, which is to the most holy place. That tells us what the oracle is. That cube that we read about a couple chapters ago. That's the most holy place. Even under the wings of the cherubim. Now remember those are the two cherubim that Solomon made in chapter 7. With the two cherubim that he made. And the two cherubim that are on the ark. The mercy seat. We saw in Revelation 4. We saw in Ezekiel 1. That's what's in heaven right now. Four beasts. In the oracle of Solomon. There are four beasts. Four cherubims. Moses only had two. For the cherubims spread forth their two wings. They have wings. Angels don't. Over the place of the ark. And the cherubims covered the ark. And the staves thereof above. So it looks like these wings. Solomon has designed through the blueprints of God, the wings of these cherubims cover that mercy seat and cover that ark completely. That's where God abode in the Old Testament for the Jews. You're just not going to step right in there. And the high priest, when he goes in there in the Day of Atonement, twice that day, one for his sins and one for the sins of the nation of Israel, you got to be careful. God is holy. They drew out the staves. Those are the poles that they were carrying. That the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place. 
That's not the most holy place, the holy place. So anybody who would go in there and trim the lamps, change the bread, offer the, the incense of the, of the prayer altar, when they walk into that room, there would be somewhere in that room are the two staves that would carry that ark. That ark is now settled. That ark has now rested. It's not going anywhere else. That ark is raptured. We find it in Revelation. It's in heaven. When Babylon comes, Nebuchadnezzar's army and destroys Jerusalem because of sins. They take everything in this temple, but that ark, it's gone. So the resting place of God's ark and mercy seat is removed because of sin. But that's not how it was supposed to be with God. Israel was supposed to do right and God would be forever on that place. Now that mercy seat is going to have the Antichrist one day pop open the doors of the veil and say, Hi, here I am. And Jesus in more sense says, Run away. Then one day the Messiah is going to show up. So it was seen out in the holy place before the oracle. It's not even in the most holy place. Though it's an item of the ark. And they were not seen without. And they were. And they, and there they are unto this day. It's a resting place. Not to be carried anymore. And you wonder. Did the staves go with the ark when God called it to heaven? Or. Staves were used when they came to the garden to arrest Jesus. They use what was the carity ark as weapons against Jesus. It's a, a staves are also weapons. They're sharp pointed stick. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone. Which Moses put there at Horeb. When they received the law. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel. When they came out of the land of Egypt. Alright. Deuteronomy 31.26 First king says it was only the, the stone, the two tablets. Deuteronomy 31, 26. You say, well, there were other items. We got to read the Bible. 31, 26. Take the book of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not the tablets of stone. The book of the law. Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Look, not in it. On the side. They made a pocket. They made a pouch. They made something on that Ark where the law was to go. Now, Hebrews 9.4. Hebrews 9.4. A book written to Hebrews, saved Hebrews. Who ought to know? They don't, they get the lesson. It's Israel history. Hebrews 9 4. And verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that's where we just left the ark, which had the golden censer. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna. Where's the manna pot? And Aaron's rod that budded. And the tables of the covenant. Now this is a stone. So there's the manna. There's Aaron's rod. Exodus 16.33. Exodus 16.33 that, that rod of Aaron was used against Pharaoh. The manna was to prove that God can provide a table in the wilderness. Exodus 16.33 And Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein. That's that golden pot. And lay it before the Lord 
to be kept for your generation. It doesn't say any <coughs> it's there, but it's not in the ark. And as far as Aaron's rod, don't know what happened to that. But here we read by the Holy Spirit of, of Solomon, there's only two tables of stone in there. And no one would have seen it because the mercy seat is covering it. You can't look in the box. And above the law, the two tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, is God's mercy seat. The only way you're going to get saved is not by the law. You're going to get saved by the mercy seat. And that's Jesus Christ. Which Moses put there in Horeb. When the, law made a, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel. When they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place. So they've left the most holy place. They are in the holy place. That the clouds filled the house of the Lord. Here comes this big cloud. Pay attention to clouds in the Bible because Jesus goes up in the cloud. And the two men, the two angels said, as he gone up, so shall he return. We're going to meet Jesus Christ. in The, the church is going to meet in the clouds. And from the clouds, we're going to meet Jesus. Woe unto you to desire the day of the Lord is not, I forget, I can't quote, but a cloudy day. It's kind of funny because there's no moon, no sun, no stars. How do you know it's cloudy? Something about this cloud. That cloud led the children of Israel by day. So that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. That's some cloud. You couldn't walk into it. It was a thick. For the glory of the Lord has filled the house of the Lord. So it's not like that, you know, you can cut it with a knife. <laughs> it's just God's glory, like, I can only go so far. I'm a sinner. I cannot go in the presence of God. I'm guilty. My conscience is telling me, stay back. Okay, verse 12, new paragraph. We'll pick up the verse 21, then we'll pick up Solomon's prayer. Lord willing, verse 22. Solomon, then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, Psalms 18, 11. Now what's that? Have you ever looked to the north sky? What do you see? You see darkness. You, thick, you see thick darkness. And everybody knows that God dwells in the north and you look up there, it's got to be dark. Well, that's as far as what we can see. Psalms 18, 11. I have surely built thee in house to dwell in. Also that thick darkness is, where are the windows in the oracle or the most holy place? There are none. As far as Solomon knows, he's not a priest. He's not of Kohath. He's not of the Levitical Aaron priesthood. He has never entered that room. So what he gets the idea is, it is pitch dark in that oracle. And where there is God, there is light. Jesus said, John 1 says, Jesus is light. And when Jesus died and gave up the ghost on that cross, that veil was rent from the top to the bottom and light went in. And what was that light? What was that entrance into the, to the mercy seat? The blood of Jesus Christ. Far better than any animal's blood. One sacrifice. I have surely built thee a house to dwell in. But God really needs a place. And settled, that's the, only, that's the first time that word shows up, settled. A place for thee to abide in forever with the children of Israel. Don't you dare ever say that your church is where God dwells amongst the people. Because how many churches are there? Baptist church, Catholic church, Protestant church, Mormon church. I mean, you tell me that every single Protestant church is wrong and not doing right? I don't know. There might be a Catholic church out there separating from the church and they might love the Lord in one, I don't know. I'll give them some benefit of doubt. But there are people there, it's our church. We want to bring everybody to our church. We want to have everybody come move around our church because everything focuses around our church. We're not going to send anybody out to go start churches. We're going to bring them to our church. 
because we got this one assembly. We've got this temple like Jerusalem. We got this temple like the Jews, and everybody's going to be focused at this one thing. And so, what's the common error for most Baptist churches to name their churches temple? I don't think you see temple as far as a Christian in the book of Acts or Paul's writing. Now, there's a temple for the Jews. What are you trying to do? You trying to set one focal, one point for everybody to meet? And have, huh? Where the Bible says, as far as that one focal point, go in all the world and preach the gospel to the disciples. After they sent Paul to persecute the church, they took off. Philip is going down. <coughs> He's witnessing all over the place. Peter's reaching out, even though he fights with the Lord about Cornelius. Then Paul picks up and he starts going out. They don't have one circle uh, location. You better get off that holy doctrine of it's my church. It's our church. You got to get off that. That's Old Testament. That's Jewish. This church here is not a church. It's a temple. And the only place that God said with one people, I will dwell amongst you. But they sinned. And God vacated. Forever. And the king... And the king turned his face about. He turned toward the congregation. Bless all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. So this is where you would get. It happens in Nehemiah. They're about to read the law. They're about to speak before God. So everybody would rise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Israel. Which spake with his mouth unto David my father. And has with his hand full fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt. See, God never brought any Christian out of anywhere of Egypt at all. I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house. That my name might be there. And, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. Saul, uh, Saul blew it. God says, I'll seek a man after my own heart. David. It was in the heart, in the heart, in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Remember, David's like, he's looking out the window one day. He sees that tabernacle. He says, God, I dwell in cedars. You're out there in a bunch of curtains. How dare I? You're almighty God. You're the wonderful God. You've given me such victory. You've given me this throne. You've given me this kingdom. And you're down there in curtain. I'm going to build you a house. I forget it was Nathan or God. They said, do, do what is it your will. God speaks to that prophet. He says, you go back to David. I've got a message for him. And the Lord said to David, my father. Whereas it was in thy heart. Wait a minute. Like I said, it was Nathan or Gad. I forget which one that spoke to David. And yet it says here, the Lord said unto David, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, men were talking to David. But the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is like that prophet was even there. I'm talking to you, David. Just as much as the Bible's written. And the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thy heart. That's the motive. To build a house unto my name. Thou didst well. You, great idea, David. I love you. That it was in thy heart. Heart, 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 heart. Not in his head. Not in his pocketbook. David was so humble. How dare you, Lord, be down there. And how dare I be up here in luxury. Nevertheless, uh-oh. Thou shalt not build a house. But thy son... That shall come forth out of thy loins for knowledge. He shall build the house unto my name. And the Lord has performed his word. Prophecy. That he spake. Prophecy. And I am risen up in the room of David my father. Type of resurrection. David's dead. And sit on the throne of Israel. As Jesus Christ will one day. As the Lord promised, God keeps his promises, and has built a house 
for the name of the Lord God of Israel, Jehovah. There are a bunch of people out there, Jehovah Witnesses, calling a kingdom hall. Hall? Hall? That's all you can give God's a hall? Go deck the halls. And I have set thee a place for the ark. That's the oracle. That's the most. I have set a room of all Israel just for you, God. You know what God says to the Christian? I'll give you a room. No, that's a perverted Bible. I'll give you a mansion. By Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And I have set thee a place for the ark. That's the oracle. That's the most holy place. Only one man was allowed in there a year. Wherein is the covenant of the Lord. Which he made with our fathers. Look at that. Honoring the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he brought forth them out of the land of Egypt. Now Solomon is going to turn to a great prayer. And it's a long prayer. We're going to have to take it another night. But remarkable. 